Now, Medjure presents The Mysterious Mr. Mercury. Marking the 20th anniversary of his death, he goes in search of the real Freddie Mercury. It's a kind of magic. A day after revealing to the world that he had AIDS, the rock star Freddie Mercury has died. As lead singer of the group Queen, he was considered outrageous. Freddie was one of Pop's most colourful characters, and to celebrate his life and his great music, one of his... 20 years ago, on the 24th of November 1991, Freddie Mercury, singer, songwriter and frontman of Queen, died of AIDS at his Kensington home in London. He was just 45. Freddie was one of the most charismatic and successful frontmen in the history of rock music. Famous for stealing the show at Live Aid and wearing a full-length ermine robe and crown in front of adoring fans at Wembley Stadium. I have never seen anybody who could literally put his hand out straight, turn it up and lift it and the whole audience would stand up. He literally had the audience in the palm of his hand. Since his death, Freddie's legacy has endured. In fact, Queen's Greatest Hits is the highest selling album of all time in the UK. As an aspiring musician who came of age in the 70s and 80s, I've always admired Freddie's huge talent and his ability to break new ground. And I defy any musician of my generation, and probably since, who has not been influenced by what Freddie did, because it was just so radical and different, and everything he did was infused with melody. And Freddie was determined to succeed. I always felt that I knew best. It sounds very precocious, I know, but I knew what I wanted. And so, therefore, even if it all ends tomorrow, I will do it on my own ground. And that's the way I'm built. I'm a survivor. I know it's all going to come to an end one day. Yet as one of the most flamboyant showmen in British rock history, Freddie Mercury was notoriously shy and private, and he rarely gave interviews. During his life, there was plenty of speculation about his sexuality, and towards the end of his life, his mystery illness. So just who was the mysterious Mr Mercury? Freddie Mercury was born Farouk Balsara on the 5th of September 1946 in Zanzibar, East Africa, where it was still part of the British Empire. His father worked as a high court cashier for the British governor, and at the age of eight, Freddie was sent to a private boarding school in India, modelled on an English public school. He was separated very early on from his parents. Being sent from Zanzibar to India, I think it took six weeks, who we went unchaperoned. So he had separation issues from quite early on. Freddie's ex-girlfriend, Mary Austin, who became a lifelong friend. I think he saw his parents once between the age of seven and 15. So there wasn't the, the usual uh, familiarity that one would have you know, with one's parents. But I think he felt very protective of them because they were older parents and um, very respectful of them. The next big change in his life came at the age of 17 when Freddie and his family fled Zanzibar as the country underwent a revolution. The Bolsara family moved to Feltham in Middlesex and Freddie became a British citizen. Once in England, Freddie was keen to go to art school mainly because by now this was a tried and tested road to a successful pop career. In 1966, he enrolled in the fashion design course at the Ealing Technical College and School of Art. Being musicians, we all sort of gravitated towards each other. Singer-songwriter Chris Smith was a fellow art student. We'd sit in the corner talking about music and playing guitars most of the time. How serious was Freddie about his art course at this point? Um I don't think he was that serious about it. He spent a lot of time drawing Jimi Hendrix, I know that. Because <laughs> he really identified with Hendrix and he, and he saw himself as that kind of a star. So he was quite sure of his abilities at this point? He had a sense of destiny, definitely. A sense of, you know, that he was uh, probably going to be immortal, you know. <laughs> Freddie's deep-seated longing to be a star meant he became a groupie of Chris Smith's band Smile, which played at local college gigs. He was literally waiting in the wings with lots of advice for us. I mean, he'd just say, oh, I wish I was in that band. You're so lucky to be in that band, you know. He was desperate to be in the band. And when Smith and the lead singer Tim Staffel left the band, 
Freddie joined together with dental student turned drummer Roger Taylor and PhD physicist turned guitarist Brian May. She keeps them away, Shonda. When John Deacon joined them on bass in 1971, the band's lineup was complete. On Freddie's suggestion, they changed the band's name to Queen. Freddie Balsara became Freddie Mercury, and his destiny was set. I consider what Freddie achieved to be the greatest transformation of any artist ever. Music broadcaster Paul Gambaccini. Well, how about a young boy from Zanzibar? which had never produced a rock star, to uh, overcome this unusual geographical background and cultural background, to even overcome bad teeth, and become a rock star. This was an amazing achievement. Queen signed the first record deal in 1972. The first hits, Seven Seas of Rye and Killer Queen, achieved chart success in the UK. But it was the release of the third album, A Night at the Opera, 1975, which gained them an international reputation. I see a little silhouette of a man. The breakthrough song was Bohemian Rhapsody. It is, let's just say, unconventional. It has no chorus and consists of three parts. Basically, there's something there for everyone, which helps explain its huge popularity. It stayed at number one for nine weeks in the UK and hit top ten in America. And its popularity has endured. It was the fourth most chosen song in the Desert Island Discs listeners' favourite discs. Bohemian Rhapsody was Freddie's masterpiece, but when he was creating it in the studio, no one working with him had a clue how it would turn out. Peter Hintz was 19 and he had just joined Queen as the roadie. He found himself working across six different studios while the song was being put together. You would have guitar parts in one studio and then vocal stuff in another. But you didn't quite know what was going on until you eventually heard the song together. I thought it was an intro tape for the tour. Thunderbolt and lightning, very, very frightening me. Paul... Great speculation about this, but what do you think the song's about? I did, of course, try to think about, well, what is this about? And then one day, Tim Rice just said to me, I think it's about Freddie coming to terms with being gay. And it sure sounds like a man is saying goodbye to a part of his past life and hello to a new part. While his public stature was growing, Freddie's private life was under strain. His six-year-long relationship with Mary Austin was coming to an end. I think we were both struggling. I was struggling not knowing in which direction my life was going. And he was struggling to understand what he should be doing. I don't know what sparked the conversation. I remember standing in the kitchen and uh, he was trying desperately to... Uh, articulate how he was feeling and, and his his lifestyle and I just said so are you telling me you're gay and he just smiled and I thought, we'll take it as yes you know and we'll leave it there. yeah and that was that was it it was it'd been a long road getting to that point Mary and Freddie remained close friends after they split up to the press and public, they were still a couple, and Freddie became an expert at deflecting intrusive questions about his private life. He thought his sexuality was really nobody's business. David Wigg was one of the few journalists Freddie trusted. But where he was troubled or unhappy, he found difficulty in holding on to relationships. He said to me, I'm thought of as a bit of a monster because that's what they see on stage. And what they can't come to terms with is that privately, all I want to be is a caring, loving person and have a normal relationship with someone I care about. But people want the glamour and what tended to happen, you know, he'd give them the Cartier bracelet and then sadly they would go. So... He said he wasn't very good at choosing the right partners, but he also admitted he was a bit promiscuous. <laughs> so it, it was difficult. Queen's success continued with their 1977 album, News of the World. 
which contained two of rock's most recognisable anthems, We Will Rock You and We Are The Champions. By the early 80s, Queen's brand of stadium rock had brought them global fame and Freddie found himself fronting one of the biggest bands in the world. He loved that fame. Queen Rhodey, Peter Hinz. But then I think later it got to haunt him a little bit, and particularly because he was very generous and I think people took his generosity to extremes. But I think that thing of performing kept him going and I'm sure if he was still around today, he would still be performing. Freddie certainly lit up many stages in his life. In 1981, Queen travelled to South America and became the first major rock band to play in Latin American stadiums. In 1984, Queen toured their 11th studio album, The Works, through five continents, including Japan and South Africa. But it was on the 13th of July, 1985, at Live Aid, the global concert for famine relief, which I was also involved in, where Freddie gave the performance of his lifetime. This next song is only dedicated to beautiful people here tonight. Freddie seemed to find his place in life on that stage. How did he prepare for that? Privately, Freddie was quite shy, not at all like the showman on stage. But I watched him at Live Aid in the dressing room and he said to me, this is a big, big one today, isn't it, David? I said, it certainly is. And you started listing who was on the bill, you know, what well, you got everybody there, didn't you? And he said, hmm, well, we have to see what we're going to do about this. He had two vodkas and then like a hurricane, I watched him run through the doorway onto that stage. And then, of course, he just took over and he had them eating out of his hand. We were the only people at Live Aid who'd actually had experience of playing football stadiums. Queen guitarist Brian May. So we had a bit of experience as to what works and how to kind of present yourself, you know, particularly Freddie. I mean, Freddie really had that knack of, of being the, the channel in the middle of the stage and the vehicle through which we connected. You know, in the middle of all this, Freddie just thinks, oh, what the hell, you know, hey yo. I mean, and th I mean, a lot of people do it these days. In those days, it was very unusual, but it was totally unique. And he's kind of sending himself up all the time as well, which, is, which makes him so lovable. You know, some people didn't realise that, I don't think. You know, there was always this thing about Freddie where his tongue was slightly in his cheek. He was a miracle. The energy that day, I've never known anything like it. Peter Hinz. I think it was a real test for them because the Works album had not done well in America and there was a feeling I think the band could have split up at that point. And Freddie was doing a solo album and, uh, and Live Aid really gave them that shot in the arm. Freddie's solo album, Mr Bad Guy, was his first project without Queen, released just before Live Aid. Although Freddie always attempted to keep his personal life as private as he could, the album lyrics speak volumes to me. Sometimes I feel I'm gonna break down lonely. I think an awful lot of Freddie's stuff, if not all of it, was autobiographical. Living on my own. Music journalist Rosie Horide. He did tell people what was going on in his life through his songs, I think. And if you listen carefully enough, you would get a very good idea of what was happening. The whole Mr. Bad Guy episode is sad in a way. Lyrically, they were not happy songs. Paul Gambaccini. Living on my own is a reflection on the downside of the kind of life he had been living in the preceding seven or eight years. Although he was obviously proving to be a sexual athlete, it didn't translate into domestic bliss. When you are on top in popular music, it's hard to have a settled domestic life as well, just because you're going to so many different places. Reinhold Mack co-produced the Mr. Bad Guy album and got to know Freddie very well in the time they worked together. He had one, one point where he actually collapsed and, uh, I mean, n not physically, but mentally and uh, he just kicked everybody out of the studio and came uh, dragged me in the control room closed all the doors and uh, you know sat on the floor and started to cry 
and you know then we talked a little bit about what was going on and he said he found himself in a dumpster in Munich and he didn't have any recollection how he got there and he realized that he needed to change something. I became close friends with Freddie as part of a, a gay subculture of show business. Paul Gambaccini. There was an episode which did make a deep impression on me because I had been to New York in 1983 and been introduced to the reality of the new disease, which did not yet have a name. And in the star bar at Heaven, the nightclub, I said to Freddie, have you altered your behavior in light of the new disease? And he said, darling, my attitude is I'm doing everything with everybody. And at that moment, I had that sinking feeling. I just thought, we're going to lose Freddie. And maybe he's saying this because in his heart of hearts, he knows it's too late. I received a telephone call from his GP asking if I could get Freddie to, to, to return his calls. Freddie's ex-girlfriend, Mary Austin. I, th I think that... The, it must be terrifying. He must have realised that he'd lived life a little bit too dangerously and that may, this maybe was the call he, was, he least wanted to take. But he eventually persuaded me that this had, had been a terrible mistake and that the results were, were negative. And so I, I think I just wanted to believe him. And, and it was about 18 months later when he told me that uh, it was actually true. Peter Freestone worked as Freddie's personal assistant for the last 11 years of his life. I spoke to Peter down the line from the Czech Republic and asked him about Freddie's last boyfriend, Jim Hutton, the man who was living with Freddie when he died. Jim Hutton came along in 1985 and he was just the right person for Freddie at that time was also the one who stayed around with Freddie once he found out he had AIDS. Peter, how did you find out that Freddie was HIV positive? He said that you probably know that I'm sick. I said, yes. And he says, you know what it is? I said, I don't know, but yeah, I have an idea. He says, OK, yes, I have AIDS. I want nobody to make any accommodation for me. I never want anybody to sort of make things easy for me. I have a life to live. I've got things I must do. So this is it. We just get on with my life. What Freddie was getting on with at this time was his collaboration with Montserrat Caballé, the famous opera singer who he greatly admired. These two larger-than-life vocalists hit it off extremely well when they met after one of her shows at the Royal Opera House Covent Garden. After the show, Freddie invited Montserrat back to his house to try out some duets. Mike Moran, the music producer Freddie was working with at the time, accompanied them on the piano. We started to sing and we went on until oh, some ridiculous hour of the morning. I think she probably went straight to the airport. And uh, she said, I'm tired of all this opera nonsense, let's try something different. So we just sang songs and she'd join in and it was just fun, really. That's all it was, fun. I had this perfect dream. This dream was me We then went back into the studio to, to work on you know, ostensibly a solo album and Montserrat kept calling. He kept, she called me again from Russia this time or from or where the hell she was. And um, he, he said, she's serious about this, we'd better do something. And so, you know, we went to the studio one day and I said, I said well, what are we going to do here? You know, and um, he said, well, I don't know, we need a working title. And he said... Well, let's call it Barcelona because that's where we met, you know. I said, that's not a bad opening line for the song, the first time that you met. The first day that Montserrat came in to put her voice down on Barcelona, after the first take, Freddie was just about in tears. He actually said, look, I have the best voice in the world singing my music. Just listen to this. There you have a man who's living with a terminal illness. Mary Austin. He knows he's terminally ill. He lives life in that direction. Maybe Barcelona would never have come about 
had he not have had this illness. I think the illness gave him that direction. I think without the illness, who knows where he would have ended up. The career may have just imploded because it was sagging at that time. He had a time span in which to fulfill his, his dream. And I think that's what he did. Freddie's final stage performances were during the Kind of Magic tour in 1986. His swan song was on August the 9th at Nebworth Park when he performed to an enraptured audience of 120,000 people. The last tour he knew and it was really hard work for him. Working through the emotional pain, knowing that it was going to be his last tour. Watching him walk off stage, I feel pain now, you know, it, it's... I, and just that look of him walking off, and I looked at him, he looked at me, and it's that, that knowing of this, this has to be the last one. Freddie may have walked off stage for the last time, but he was determined to keep singing until the end. As rumours began spreading about his declining health, rumours which he and the band flatly denied, Queen continued to record in Montreux, Switzerland, a place where Freddie found a certain amount of inner peace and tranquility, away from the constant scrutiny of the British press. You know, Freddie's becoming weakened by this horrible disease and he finds it hard to stand up a lot of the time. Brian May... And Freddie at that time said, write me stuff. He said, I know I don't have very long. Keep writing me words, keep giving me things. I will sing, I will sing, you know, and then you can do what you like with it afterwards, you know, finish it off. The Innuendo album, released in February 1991, was the last Queen album to be released while Freddie Mercury was still alive. His work as a lyricist on the Innuendo album was the peak of his career. Paul Gambaccini. Freddie faced death and he spoke openly about the rumours about him, innuendo I'm going slightly mad who would want to write a song called that and then of course these are the days of our lives the sun was always shining we just live for fun Sometimes it's Roger started off writing these are the days of our lives about his kids and the way he felt about life and how it comes back um, but of course in that context it had another meaning. Freddie actually kind of says a goodbye in that song. He did the lines of those songs one by one, a line at a time. David Wig. But he wanted to do it because he knew these would be the final recordings and he wanted the fans to have something, you know. And at the end of the day, he was absolutely exhausted, but he'd done it. David, how did Freddie keep his illness a secret from the outside world for so long? Uh, the drugs were uh, delivered in compact discs so that nobody knew they were actual drugs, so it didn't go, give a clue to any of the media outside how serious it, it was. He did not want nurses to be appearing, which would just attract attention. Freddie's personal assistant, Peter Freestone. There was two of us who were taught inside the house how to give him the infusions. We were giving him infusions of drugs three times a day. The press kept a vigil outside Freddie's house in the days leading up to his death, but it wasn't until the day before he died that he put an end to the speculation about his health by issuing a statement announcing to the world that he was indeed HIV positive. Although Freddie was wearing Jim Hutton's wedding ring on his deathbed, he left his Kensington mansion to his ex-girlfriend and long-time friend Mary Austin. His reasoning for leaving me the house was that had things been different, we would have been married and he said you would have been my wife and this would have been yours anyway. So I think that's why you should have the house. I felt awkward, I have to say. Um, I just couldn't refuse him. It was something he wanted and what a beautiful gift. The sad fact is that if he had lived another few years, he would have benefited from the developments in antiretrovirals and may still have been alive today. Can you sum up what Freddie Mercury brought to this world? Oh, well, how do you sum up a genius? I think the best thing you could say about him that he was absolutely unique. There are very few unique ones, and he was a unique one. 
He was a generous man, a kind man, an impatient man sometimes, but utterly dedicated to what he felt was important, which was making music. No matter how far away it becomes, people will look back and say that he was one of the great showmen. It's just such a shame that like so many people in our business, it all stopped too soon. The Mysterious Mr. Mercury was presented by Midgeor and produced by Melissa Fitzgerald. It was a Blakeway production for BBC Radio 4.